Thank you very much, Justin. And I want to start by misquoting Gandhi um, by saying that if anyone was to ask you what you think of a free press, I think the best response would be to say that it would be a very good idea. And in that spirit, I want to um, just quickly go over some of the pieces of research on media coverage of Jeremy Corbyn that we in the Media Reform Coalition carried out. There were three, uh, three, three ones to talk about. The first one was uh, looking at um, coverage of his first week in office, and it found that out of nearly 500 articles, 60% of those articles were overtly negative, <coughs> only 13% positive and 27% neutral. And you could say maybe that was just a one-off. The next piece of systematic research was carried out by researchers at the LSE, and they found a very similar phenomenon, that the press, as they put it, wasn't a critical watchdog, but it was an antagonistic attack dog, attempting to delegitimize a democratically elected leader. Then, as Justin's already mentioned, um, just in uh, a couple of months back, our most re recent research looked at TV and online coverage of uh, Jeremy Corbyn around the time of the shadow cabinet resignations. And it found, for example, that twice as much attention was paid on the main BBC news bulletins, twice as much attention was paid to critics of Jeremy Corbyn than to his supporters. And you have to think it must be bad when even the former chairman of the BBC Trust, Sir Michael Lyons, insisted on these are his words, not mine, that there has been some extraordinary attacks on the elected leader of the Labour Party. Now, the fact is we're told by some people this is okay for, for two main reasons. One is that it's nothing new, that all Labour leaders have faced the same hostility. And secondly, you can't blame journalists because they're just doing their job, because actually they, would, they argue he deserves the bad coverage. Well, I was intrigued to see how this holds up as a historical argument. And it is just not, and you won't be surprised by this, it is not the case that all Labour leaders have faced the kind of um, uh, attacks from the media that Jeremy Corbyn has. So I looked at, for example, um, uh, at the leader who's perhaps closest politically to Jeremy Corbyn, George Lansbury, who actually resigned as Labour leader in 1935 because his pacifist principles were not compatible with the rest of the Labour leadership. But what was the reaction from, from the press at that time? He was virtually ignored virtually ignored. They did, certainly didn't say any nice things about him. They were ignored. Look at the other um, uh, leaders of the Labour Party. I've just got a couple of things. One is that I, I did it the day, the covers of the Daily Mail, the day after they were elected leader. This is from um, uh, 1963, and it's Harold Wilson. And you won't be able to read it, but it's on the front page, and this is what the Daily Mail, the same Daily Mail, as I show their most recent front cover, this is what they said. Without wishing Mr. Wilson success in the next general election, we offer him the good wishes which are the right of any man who takes on so onerous and responsible an office. You couldn't think of a more different approach, which is taken up not just by the mail, but whole sections of the media now. And you see that again, just a couple more examples. The election of Jim Callaghan um, in the mid 70s, actually very positive from the Daily Mail. And of course, you will not be surprised by what happened in 1994 with Tony Blair, where he gets a very good, a very positive um, front page about all the tremendous qualities he uh, has. It is Blair's hour. Now, of course, it's the case that the, the, um, uh, both Neil Kinnock and Ed Miliband um, were mocked and or vilified, but actually not so much when they were first um, elected. When you compare to the reaction of, of the male um, to Jeremy Corbyn's election from last September. So, uh, just if you just show us, you'll, you'll remember this, the next slide. That's what greeted him um, uh, as soon as the, the morning after he was elected. So, when people say actually journalists are doing their job because they're reflecting on the bad performance, you might want to point out to them that that headline was actually um, produced on the day that he was elected, before he'd had even the opportunity to do the terrible things that he's alleged to have done. Um, now, the difference is that Jeremy Corbyn, and I think the movements that he represents, um, uh, articulates, uh, represents a threat to the powerful in a way that right-wing Labour figures never did. That is what underlies the extraordinary hostility to his leadership. And any radical movement that refuses to abide by the usual consensus on austerity, on immigration, on foreign policy, can expect to be either marginalised or ridiculed, to be misrepresented or ignored. And I think that tells you a lot about the balance of power in the mainstream media. If you depart from the rules, you should expect to be punished. But the best response, from my perspective, to this is not to bow down before media power, it's to do the opposite. It's to intensify your campaigning, it's to sharpen your opposition. And I think that's the lesson of history. 
Trade union rights weren't won by chartists who developed a clever media strategy. The suffragettes, as far as I'm aware, did not stop smashing windows because it didn't play well in Middle England. And today I suspect that junior doctors will be best able to defend the NHS, not simply by trying to make reasonable arguments on news bulletins, which actually they do when they're given the choice, uh, the opportunity, but by organising the action itself that makes it impossible for journalists to ignore their demands. Now, the Media Reform Coalition has been around for five years. We started in response to the terrible abuses of power carried out inside the Murdoch press and, and elsewhere, something I should add that we were reminded of um, a couple of days ago when the notoriously left-wing Parliamentary Standards Committee accused both the editor and the legal manager of the News of the World, as it was, of lying to Parliament in the wake of the phone hacking crisis. But our aim was and remains not about blaming individual journalists, but actually fighting and campaigning for the conditions which would allow journalists to do their jobs free from the contamination of proprietorial influence and vested interests. And that remains the case today as we press for changes to media ownership rules and new ways of funding public interest journalism. But for me, and this is where I'll finish, the biggest single boost to a democratic media and to a, a democratic society will come from campaigns representing those whose voices are largely excluded from mainstream agendas. Because the BBC, Murdoch, Dacre and the rest of what used to be called Fleet Street, they can never hold power to account because they are precisely part of those very power structures. So Jeremy Corbyn, and I think this is a lesson that applies to all progressive movements, Jeremy Corbyn can't afford to rely on an army of spin doctors and communications consultants. He needs to rely, I believe, on the power of his base to expose the inequality, to expose the warmongering and profiteering, profiteering that is opposed by many millions of British people. This, after all, is exactly the same public, a majority of whom, according to YouGov a couple of weeks ago, also believe that the mainstream media, in the words of YouGov, as they put the question, is, quote, deliberately biased against Jeremy Corbyn. So for me, just to finish, a radical movement today has to make an effective use of social media. It has to engage with mainstream media to the extent that it is possible. But above all, it means rejecting and organizing against a politics of austerity and desperation and offering and fighting for an alternative that will be hard to marginalize, to distort or to ignore. Thank you.